good to be here. God's good, amen? amen. Lamentations tells us His mercy's new every day. Okay, you just think about the sun setting at night, and y'all go to y'all go to bed, and you're thinking about the day and thinking about different things. And I think you ought to pray and ask God to help you and ask God to forgive you. Amen. Amen. Then you wake up the next morning, sun shining again, birds are singing, that north wind's blowing out here, and your hair is sticking up like that. And they say, "Ain't God good?" Amen. Um, I was trying to put something up on the screen, and I, and I can't. Uh, I've got to do some figuring. I don't have time to do that. But we have some software that uh, a lady wrote for us uh, about a year ago. And uh, this, this woman is a professional software writer. She sits and just writes code, software code for a living. And I had the idea of a Bible search software for the King James. It was just, and that, and that does a lot of things, but it's just really been a blessing to a lot of people. And if you want to write this website down, it's purebiblesearch.com. Now, when, I, when she called me and she said, I think I can write this for you, how do you want it? I said, I want it under the GNU public license. And what that means is it's free software. And if somebody wants to, they can download a copy of it and get into the code and do whatever they want to with it. That's, that's the public license. But it's perpetually free software. No one makes any money off of it. And she wrote it, and I was just stunned at how it turned out. And she did, that was the 1.0 version, and we're now at the three point whatever version of it. And people are just absolutely loving it. Because I'm going, to tell you, I'm going to tell you where my heart is. I love it when God's people are free. Amen. God's people are supposed to be free. Paul said, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again in the yoke of bondage. And to, there's a lot of bondages that people like to lay on people and usually has to do with terms of salvation. And, and men will put people in bondage. That is the wicked, defiled nature of mankind is he loves to put people in bondage underneath him. And preachers especially are susceptible to doing it. All right. I mean, I've got, it, I've got that nature in me. But I like for people to be free. And let me tell you something. God designed you to be able to read and understand and know His Word just as good as any preacher, any scholar, any Bible seminary. God designed you to be able to know what this Bible says. Do you believe that? Say amen. amen. We need not that any teacheth us, but we have the Holy Ghost teaching us. In fact, I'd like for you to turn to 1 Corinthians this is not the message. This is kind of a little sidelight I'm going to throw in here. Uh, but purebiblesearch.com is the website. You can download it for Windows. Uh, it works on Windows 7, Windows 8.1. Uh, you can download it for Mac if you have a Mac. If you, any, anybody uses Linux, like Ubuntu or OpenSUSE or anything like that, there's a Linux version of it as well, and she has the instructions on how to install it. And I've used it on Linux, I've used it on Windows, and it, and it works uh, just as good on both of them. And like I say, it's a free download, it doesn't cost you anything, it's not a trial period or anything like that, we don't get any money out of it, she doesn't get any money out of it, because I think God's Word is free. Amen? Amen? And so anyway, <clears throat> and God has blessed us and we like to make it for free. So you can go to the website there and download it, alright? When you install it, I want you to just start searching the scriptures. What did the Bereans do? They searched the scriptures to see whether these things were true or not. Because you hear you have the apostles and they're preaching this new doctrine. They're preaching this new covenant. This, this way of salvation. And the Bereans were noble. And they said, thank you men, I appreciate it, that's a good message. But excuse us, we're going to go study the Bible to see whether this is true or not. Now I want you to think about that. Here are these people back around, you know, 80, 40, 80, 50, somewhere around in there. And the Bibles that they have don't look like this. They're reading scrolls. They're going through and pouring over Isaiah and Psalms and the things that they have. And it probably took them months, if not years, to search the scriptures to see whether these things are true or not. Practically everybody in this room can do what they did in a matter of hours or even a matter of minutes. Because we have these tablets, 
We have these smartphones. Download a Bible app on there. Search the scriptures. You hear something, you say, well, I don't know if that's right or not. Search the scriptures. We have this software. There's others. There's even a, a, a website out there called Blue Letter Bible. You can search King James. I mean, you can get right down into it and search and know what the Bible says. We can do in a matter of minutes what it took the Bereans a matter of months to do. What I'm telling you is there's no excuse for your ignorance of the Word of God. Amen. Zero excuse. Okay? And I'm just, and what I'm telling you is that will make you free. You shall know the what? The truth. And the truth shall not set, I get, that's one of my pet thieves. Don't say set you free. It says make you free. There's a difference. You know what the difference is? Open the cage to the canary cage. That canary may not leave. But you set it free, but it may not leave. Go in there and grab the canary. Throw her up in the air. Now she's free. Amen? Amen. That's the difference right there. You'll know the truth, all right? So study the scriptures. Let me show you how the Bible tells you to study the scriptures. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, the Bible says, uh, verse 12, Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit of which is God, of God, that we might know the things that are what? What's that word there? Freely. Do you see that word? Freely given to us of God. That means they ought to be free. Amen. Amen. It's good preaching, Mike. Amen. Keep going. I will, all right? Verse 13, which things we also speak. Not, and by the way, let me ask you, how much money did the Apostle Paul charge to show up to preach? <laughs> Zero. Zero. They even took up collections for him and he wouldn't take it. Even though he could have, and he said, you know, now should have muzzled the ox, tread without the corn, and he said, a servant's worthy of his hire. They took up offerings for Paul, and he wouldn't take them, because he wanted to set a high standard. Now, I'm not saying it's wrong to pay a preacher. That, that's how he makes his living, and I understand that. But Paul had a high standard, and he wanted to make everybody know that the gospel was always intended to be free. Okay? And so anyway, which, which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth. Did you get that? Can I tell you something? I haven't read a commentary in years. Okay? I haven't read one in years. Wow. I don't need it. Don't need it. In fact, I'm going to tell you, in some cases, you're better off without it. Let me tell you why. L finish the verse out. Not, which, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. You know what that means? Spiritual things are things that are in the Bible. This Bible is spirit. Jesus said, my words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. And he said, compare spiritual things here with spiritual things over here. So you're reading something in the New Testament. And then you go back and you read something in the Old Testament. All of a sudden you see a lamb in the Old Testament. And you go, wait a minute. I know what that lamb is. I know that that lamb in the Old Testament represents the sinless lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And you read something in the Bible and the Holy Ghost is telling you things and all of a sudden doodads go up and down your back. Amen. You ever had them before? Amen. Now, I don't know how sophisticated you up here in North and Dakota and Minnesota are, but we call them doodads and <laughs> things going up and down our back and all of a sudden tears well up in your eyes and you're going, God, you're so good to show me that. That's the Holy Ghost teaching you things. No man taught you that. The Holy Ghost did. Amen? Amen. 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 So you compare spiritual things to spiritual things. Stick with the Bible. Paul said that all scripture, how much? All scripture is given. By the way, he didn't say was given by inspiration. He didn't say it's past tense. He didn't say, well, they had it back then, but we don't really have it now. He said all scripture is given by inspiration of God and it's profitable for what? Doctrine. You want to know that if what I'm saying is true, go to the scriptures. Amen. God, let God be true and what? Every man a liar. And I'll tell you something. I don't think that I know everything and I don't think that I say everything the right way. I get messed up lips, my mind doesn't work sometimes, and I'm human and I see through a glass darkly like everybody else does. So I'm telling you, you take what I said, it's being recorded, we're going to put it on our web, we're going to put it all over the internet, and you go back and listen to it, and you say, now wait a minute, Hoggard said something, and I know that's not true, because over here in 2 Corinthians it says this, and back here in Isaiah it says that. Okay? Is that, is that a fair enough deal? 
That's what you do. Go to the scriptures. Don't go to some other website where somebody disagrees with me and they're going to give you five reasons why they don't like me. And they're out there. Trust me. Go to the scriptures. You know who my fiercest opponents are? So-called Christian religious people who don't want you to get anything from the Bible. They want you to get it from them. They hate my guts. So I'm going to tell you to read your Bible. You come up to my table and ask me a question. What am I going to do? Let me show you. Let me show you right here. Goes over here. Isaiah 28 is a beautiful passage in there. He said, whom shall, whom shall the Lord, uh, in fact, I better read it or I'm going to mess it up. <laughs> Isaiah 28, turn there. Hurry, hurry, hurry. I got a plane that leaves out of here at 5 p.m. I got to be done by then. <laughs> You'll drive me. <laughs> yeah, go, Hoggard, go. Yeah, come on. That's what that means in my mind. Amen. <laughs> For, look at verse 11. For with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people. Did you know God speaks more languages in Hebrew and Greek? Amen. Oh, amen. On the day of Pentecost, what were they doing? Speaking, other tongues. speaking in tongues. Speaking all those languages and all those people around there going, we hear the word of God in our tongue. Yes. See, I believe that. Amen. Oh, amen. It's verse 12. To whom he said, this is the rest wherewith you may cause the weary to rest. And this is refreshing, yet they would not hear. And I want you to look at verse 13. But the word of the Lord was unto them precept upon precept. Precept upon precept. Line upon line. Line upon line. Here a little and there a little. Get, get a little bit over here in Psalms. Get a little bit over here in Matthew. Get a little bit out of the book of Judges. Go over here to the book of Revelation. Go read some of the law. Go read, some, go read uh, Leviticus. Go read Numbers. And you say, well, I don't understand that. Then what you do is you go back to the New Testament and you start reading things there. You start reading Hebrews and all of a sudden Leviticus is wide open to you. You're going, that's really neat. I think I understand a little bit of that. But that's how I study the Bible. There's also another principle too. By the way, I didn't read the verse that I wanted to read. Verse 9, he said, whom shall he teach knowledge and whom shall he make to understand doctrine? God is looking for people whom he can teach what this book says. Are you ready to learn? ready to listen yes. not listen to me Amen. The, you know what a preacher's job is it's to awaken you to the Word of God right. you know, I'll say so, I like to listen to good preachers and I do I listen to them and they'll say something and I'll just shut it off right then because they said something from the Bible and the Holy Ghost just working in me dealing with me Mike go look at that Mike let me show you this and that's what I like about it all right whom shall he teach knowledge and whom shall he make to understand doctrine them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast and then he says for precept must be on precept and that's what they mean is there's a precept here in the Old Testament precept here in the New Testament and so you study both of them and God will give you good doctrine, all right? Then there's another issue that I, I just came upon several years ago is I can tell you some of the methods of false prophets, wolves in sheep's clothing. And God said they would be among us. And if you're not careful and you don't know this book, they will put you in bondage. I promise you that's what they're seeking to do. They're seeking to put people in bondage to them and if they tell you that it's this way you better believe it this way or God will pull you out of he'll pull, he'll take salvation away from you that's what they're telling you you send us your money and if you're not faithful enough to send us a thousand dollars or five thousand dollars then you won't be blessed by God and you'll go oh I didn't know the Bible said that well it doesn't amen. read it <laughs> amen? amen here's something I learned a while ago Paul said that we walk circumspectly there's two, uh, English is made up of different languages. Circumspectly is Latin. Circum is a circle. Speckly is, I have spectacles on my head that helps me make a spectacle of myself. <laughs> I, people look at me. That's what that means. You know what that means? Walk looking around. Now, number one, anybody, has anybody ever served in the military and was out on a field of battle? Anybody ever been on a field of battle? What do you do, Rick? Amen? Amen. You don't just walk in the bat. You don't just walk in the forest or the jungle or anything like that. You go looking around. So that's wise. Amen. God wants us looking around, see what's around us. But number two, when you're reading your Bible and you're searching things in the scripture, like with the software or something like that, and you pull something up, go read that verse. But don't just stop there. Make a big circle around it. 
Go back about seven or eight verses. Go back to the beginning of the chapter. Go back to the chapter before that and read that and then read past that. And you've made a big circle around that verse so that you know that what you're thinking about it matches what the whole counsel of God says about that, about that verse. Isn't that good stuff? That's free. Amen. Didn't charge you a dime for that. All right. All right. Now this, this is going to cost you. No, I'm just kidding. Um, yeah, no. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 10. You can turn in your Bible to all these places, and I'm just going to stick all with Scripture this morning. And I'm just, uh, I'm, I'm missing my church back home. I love them. I, I thank the world of them. I've been there. Um, I've been there for the most part since 1974. Not as pastor. I was eight in 1974. Oh, well, amen. I appreciate that. This church is glad you're here. Okay. Yeah, and, and, and that's right. God has given us a, a following literally all over the world. I don't, have really, I don't have time to talk about that. I want to preach. But I'm going to treat you like it's my church this morning. Well, your church is here. Amen. So I'm going to preach to you and, and give you the counsel of God. There's issues that come up in life. When I was a young man, Lisa and I were first married. I was very full of myself, very prideful, very cocky, and very arrogant, and I felt like that I had the tiger by the tail, and, and I could just do, and wasn't going to have any problems in life, and everything was going to zip along. And what I was doing was I, was I was suppressing a lot of issues of life, and we do that when we're young. We think, we think the world's going to bow and kneel to us, and everything's going to go our way, and then you get older, and all of a sudden it doesn't work that way. And then one day you recognize that you're, in a, you're lying in a crumpled heap of everything that you thought was yours in life. Amen. Been there. Okay? And God didn't just take me to a little Bible college for a couple years and then let me read the Bible for a couple years and then try to tell you how to live. I've been through some pretty rough stuff in life. A lot of it self-inflicted and self-imposed. Okay, so I know a little bit about what I'm going to share with you this morning. And uh, Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, he said, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. You cannot shoot devils with bullets. Okay, you cannot do it. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. He's telling us that in Ephesians, right? So he said, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. If we're ever going to win a war for this country, it'll have to be done on our knees and it'll have to be God's pulpits preaching God's word instead of all this junk and this fluff that Brother Oakland and some of these other guys have been talking about. Can I hear you say amen? amen. The war for America will be fought on our knees. Okay? Now, arm yourself if you want to. Amen. I believe in guns. Amen. Amen. Okay, I got a video on it. God, Guns, and Liberty. And I did, I did what some of you are thinking. Boy, I don't know if that's right. I went to the scriptures to see if God allows us to use force, deadly force, to protect our families and our property and our nation. And God said yes. When Jesus sent the disciples out, he said, take a sword. Yes. Amen. That's what he said. Now I'm not saying you go door knocking, if they don't get saved, blow their head off. I'm not saying that, okay? I'm just saying, <laughs> that, that he said, he's, you know what he's telling them? You're gonna have to protect yourself. So this, number one, take this sword, and then take something else. I won't get into all that, but anyway. Our weapons of warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. And I want you to look at that idea of strongholds, and I want you to think about what that represents. Think about the devil in your life right now. Don't think about the devil and Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton and all these other people we don't like and all these rap stars. and all this. Don't think about what the devil's doing over there. Think about what he's doing in you and with you and to you. Think about what he's doing in your marriage. Think about, think about what he did to your marriage. Think about what he did to your children. Your grandchildren. Think about what he's done to your home. Think about what he's done to your church that you had to leave because you couldn't take it anymore. Think about that. He said the strongholds. He said, casting down imaginations. Think about them throwing Jezebel out of that window. That's a good illustration of that. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God. And bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. 
That sounds good, doesn't it? Amen. Let me ask you a question. Who in here thinks that's easy? We like to get all proud and say, well, I, I kind of keep the Ten Commandments. If you want to ask me, I, 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 uh, I don't go after other idols and I, I follow God and, you know, honor my father and mother. And then we start getting into thou shalt not commit adultery. And you say, well, bless God, me and my wife, you know, we've been together and had been. But what did Jesus say? Think about, think about lying. Think about bearing false witness. Think about murdering and wanting somebody dead, hating them so bad you wanted them dead. Think about, and listen, you're not the only one that's ever dealt with that emotion and that issue. I mean, you think that you're pretty good and pretty moral person, but you go, let's say one week, without coveting something that's not yours. Without lusting after something or someone that does not belong to you. Don't tell me how good you are. Because I know for a fact you're not. You know how I know it? Because I'm not. And I know that I'm made out of the same dirt that you are. Okay? I'm just telling you how it is. If, I, if anybody in this world needed a Savior, it was Mike Hoggard. Okay? So he said, bring it. And I'm telling you, if you think that, well, that's good. I'm just going to bless God from here on out. I'm going to bring every thought into captivity. Doesn't work like that. Now, having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Now, I want, I want to show you something here a little bit. I want you to take a look at this picture, okay? This, this is the extent of my graphics capabilities. I can draw a circle and write stuff in it, and that's it, okay? So I want you to think we're going to apply this to areas of your life. I think our nation's in trouble, don't you? Okay, but let's back up a little bit. Let's make it personal. Let's make it you. You're the believer. You have a home, you're trying to raise a family. You, maybe you attend a church and you know that the devil can build strongholds in a church just as well as he can build them in Hollywood and Nashville and every other, and Washington DC and every other wicked place. You know the devil can get in and build strongholds in a church and I'll explain to you what that is in a minute. But I want you to notice that surrounding these things that are precious to us. And by the way, I'm not preaching, who in here is from Canada? Anybody from Canada? How's it going, eh? I want you to think about Canada, your country, okay? That's your nation. That's where you come from. It's where you're born. It's where you live. And that's what's special to you, okay? I like Canada. I wouldn't mind. I visited there a couple times, but it's not my country. And if something bad happens up there, I'm going to say, boy, that's bad. But I don't want it to happen to America. America's my country, okay? I've been to Kenya several times. I love it. I love the people, but it's not my country. My country is special to me, and I, this is what I grieve over of what's going on in America. But picture all of these things that are precious to us with a wall built around it. Isaiah 26, 1, the Bible says, In that day shall this song be sung in the land of Judah. We have a strong city. Salvation will God appoint for walls and for bulwarks. God is going to save you, but he's going to save you by building a wall around you. When, these, when you hear these clowns start talking about, oh, let's tear all the walls down between us. You say, nope, stop right here. We're not doing it. That wall's there for a reason. Okay? That wall is to keep me in and to keep you out. Amen. Why, do we pin up, why do we pin up our sheep and our cattle? Why do, we pin up our chick why do we pin up our chickens? So they don't stray and so the coyotes and the wolves don't get them. Am I right? So that, that pen is for their protection. That's, right. That's what it's for. And God uses this Bible as the guidelines and the rules for daily life. And that is a wall that God will build around your life and he'll protect you. He'll protect your family. He'll protect your home. He'll protect your church with that. Isaiah 60 verse 18. Violence shall no more be heard in thy land, wasting nor destruction within thy borders. But thou shalt call thy walls salvation in thy gates praise. Notice how he connected it. Walls equals salvation. Oh, wow. Think of Jesus and the sheepfold. Yes. He keeps the sheep in the sheepfold. Now if he's going to go out and have them go in pastures, he goes with them. He don't just say, you sheep going out there and they'll come back now before dark. He don't tell them that. He goes with them. And if that shepherd, let me preach now, if that shepherd 
That shepherd detects anything wrong out there. He's either going to fight it there and he's going to say, we need to get back inside. Hurry up and get back inside. That's what your shepherd will do for you. Can I, can I hear you say amen so far? Now I want you to watch this. Ephesians chapter 6 teaches us what is against us. It is principalities. Those are princes in the Bible. The prince of the people of Persia is a, is a spirit prince. It's a king. It has dominion over areas. All right? Powers. And I'm going to explain these as we move on. And I'm going to make you uncomfortable. Because I'm going to name some things that are issues in your life. And you don't want that talked about. But I'm going to talk about it. Rulers of darkness. Think about night owls. Think about uh, creatures that roam through the night. That's a picture for us. All right? Spiritual wickedness in high places. Think about it. Think about the leadership of a home. The leadership over a church. The leadership over a denomination or a big ministry. The leadership of our country or the state or province you live in. Think of uh, who was it brought me the book on Manitoba, the, the Masonic stuff in Manitoba. That is spiritual wickedness in high places. That's where the center of government is. And there is a spirit called spiritual wickedness in high places that governs over that area. You believe that? Okay. That's what that is. And I'm going to show you what those are in here a little bit. But I want you to notice how God shows us what Lucifer wants to do. Notice that he said, I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation. Who is the congregation? It's the people. They're congregating together. Do you think the devil wants to rule over a church? Yes. You better believe he does. That's his goal. That's, his, that's what he wants. He wants God's heritage. That's what he wants. He wants your vineyard. He wants your family. That's your congregation. He wants those things. He wants, he wants the people in the land. That's what he wants. That's his goal is to sit and rule over them. And you've got to be on guard for this thing. He said in Ezekiel 28, I'm a God. I sit in the seat of God. So watch this. Now, here's God, and he's in the heart of the believer. He's, he's ruling over a family. He's ruling over your life. The devil wants to come in and sit where God is sitting. Who believes that? Amen. I, listen, you, we're in a battle. We're in a battle. Every day we wake up, we're going to have to, you're going to have to wake up and say, man, I got to fight the devil again today. I hadn't been awake five minutes and I can tell you right now, I'm going to have to fight the devil off most of this day. God, I need your help. Amen. 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 This thing gets serious. Second Thessalonians 2, he sitteth in the temple of God. Well, what is the temple of God? It's this right here. He said, I want to sit, I want to sit as God in the temple of God. So you believe, three examples already is telling you that the devil wants to rule over your life, over your home, over your children, over your grandchildren, over your, over your church. How many churches having problems right now? How many churches where we find out the youth pastor is queer? Sodomite. How many pastors are being busted in their affairs? How many churches, I mean, th these guys are just pumped you full of information of all this stuff going into the churches. And these pastors are letting this nonsense in. Here's God sitting in the heart of a church wanting to be in the midst of his congregation because he said, where two or more gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. And there he is ruling over the church. And all of a sudden now the devil's trying to make inroads inside that church. And they throw Christ out. And here comes the devil in. I got my place right here. How did he get in there? How did he get in there? If there's a wall... If there's a wall around this thing, how did he get in? Breaches. A breach is there's a wall or a dam. Dam is meant to hold the water back. What happens? There's a breach in the dam and the water comes shooting out of there. What was meant to protect is no longer there. So let me ask you a question. If you've got iron bars over every window and every door in your house, so that nobody gets in and you leave your front door unlocked and open? How easy is that? But you know, mice, they don't use doors. 
You know what they'll do? They'll find a weak, listen to me, now you listen to me. They will find a weak spot. They'll find your weak spot. And they'll dig and dig and work until they get in. But you listen to me this morning. This might help you. Some of, there may be somebody here, somebody watching online. I don't know. There may be somebody here who right now you're thinking, I don't think I can make it much longer. I don't think I can. I want to help you this morning. Isaiah chapter 7, will all, the Bible will always tell you what's going on in the spiritual realm. He said in Isaiah verse, chapter 7, verse 5, because Syria, Ephraim, and son of Remaliah. I like to count things. There's three things that's going to move in. Now I want you to think of things that come in threes in the Bible. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. See how simple that is? You may not have a real issue with pride. I guarantee you it's either your eyes or your flesh is where you're weak. I guarantee it. You're not so spiritual and so holy that the devil can't find any weaknesses in your life. Who, do you, who are we kidding? You know, how, you know how I preach like this and know so much about this? God confronted me about my own. I didn't like it. But God knew what he was doing. Amen. God brought me to a place in life where I was going to have to deal with Mike Hoggard. Or I wasn't going to make it. God began to show me the things that are wrong in my life. And I know how it works. I know you can stand up and preach messages and not be right with God. I did it. So I'm just telling you how it is. Syria, Ephraim, and the son of Remaliah have taken evil counsel. That's a conspiracy. You believe in conspiracies? There's one right there for you. They took evil counsel against thee, saying, let us go up against Judah. Judah's got a wall around it, and we're going to vex it. You know what that means? We're going to keep pounding at them until we find out where the weak spots are in the wall. Some of you sitting here this morning have never taken a drink in your life, and it's not an issue with you. You're just going, I just, I just don't have a taste for alcohol. It makes me sick. I just don't want anything around it. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Wonderful. So the devil tried that with you about 30 years ago, figured out it wouldn't work. So he said, you know what? I know he's got something somewhere. I know he's got issues. I know he's got a weak spot somewhere. We're just going to find it and we're not going to stop until we do. So they vexed you until they found it. They said, we're going to vex it and let us make a breach therein for us. And then set a king in the, mid in the midst of it. See how it works? Look here, look here. Here is God sitting in the midst of his people. Here's a wall to protect it. And yet the three things came in and said, we're going to find where the weakness is. And we're going to put a breach in that wall so that we can come and go as we please. And you can't stop us. Right? You can't stop us. Proverbs 15, 4 says, a wholesome tongue is a tree of life. You know who had a wholesome tongue? Jesus Christ. Amen. He never said a dirty word in his life. Amen? Amen? He never told a dirty joke. He never told the apostles. Look at that Mary Magdalene over there. Whew. He had a wholesome tongue. Amen. Amen? Why? Amen. By the way, his tongue was so wholesome and so pure he spit into the, mud, into the dirt and made mud, rubbed it on a guy's eyes, and he could see for the very first time in his life. Oh, oh, <laughs> but perverseness is a breach in the spirit. Wow. Are you catching this? There are perverted things on TV, perverted things on the internet. There are perverted doctrines. There are perverted Bibles. Their perver perversion is all around us. And it's always going to try to find a way in, isn't it? Think about what happened at your church. Think about, think about how the pastor left in disgrace. 
Think about how I, I have a friend that was pastoring a church out in Oklahoma. And there was, he said he had to deal with I don't know how many adulterous affairs inside the church while he was there. Wow. One after another. I know how it goes, people. I know how it goes. I know how it works. And I'm telling you, they won't stop until they find that weak spot. Back in Nehemiah, you know what Nehemiah, you know what Nehemiah is talking about? You know what the first thing they did when they got back to Jerusalem after 70 years of captivity? Built a wall. Because when they got back and they looked at Jerusalem, the wall was all busted up, stones laying everywhere. And they get there and going, yeah, we got it back, but we can't live here for very long. They'll come and get us. There's people out there that hate our guts. They'll come and they'll kill us if we don't. So you know what? They started building a wall. And they started working on it. I like that picture. They had, had a brick in one hand, had a sword in the other. Amen? Hey, ladies, give me some bricks. Hi, get back. I'll kill you. Hey, give me some. Amen? And there's guys, on the, guys out there going, whoa, here they come. And they drop the bricks and come on, I'm ready for you. You know what they did? You want to listen to me now? They never dropped the sword. Amen. Never dropped the sword. Watch this. But here's, here's what happened. They realized, here they are standing there with swords, building a wall. And the enemies of Israel say, we can't let them build that wall. And we can't stop them. They got swords. What are we going to do? It came to pass that when Samballat, Tobiah, and the Arabians, and the Ammonites, and the Ashdodites heard the walls of Jerusalem were made up, and that the breaches began to be stopped. They were very wroth and conspired all of them together to come and to fight against Jerusalem and to hinder it. The moment you decide, God, I want it stopped. I'm tired of it. Get ready. You're fixing to fight. The fight is on. And you know what? You may find out you're going to have to fight other people. Whew. Now... You want to know what some of these strongholds are? Can I name things? Can I name things? That's two people. That's all I need. <laughs> Principalities. There's areas of authority in every state of life. Principalities come in and they, the principalities are all about changing who's the king. The king of America is not Barack. Amen. The king of America is the Constitution. Yes. Principalities are all about changing who's in charge. Okay? Areas of rebellion or pride. There's some young people here. I want you to listen to me. God gave you a mom and dad. They're not perfect. If they're honest, they'll tell you that. They're not perfect. Nobody is. Cops are not perfect, but when they flip those lights on, you pull over. They bear not the sword in vain, the Bible says. Young people, don't rebel against your mom and dad. Okay, here some old people say amen. amen. Wives, do not usurp authority over the husband. Well, you don't know my husband. He don't leave the toilet seat down. He leaves his dirty socks everywhere. He thinks I'm his maid. He don't talk to me right. He don't do that right to me. I just, I don't know. I just think I married the wrong man. You married him. Wives, submit to your husbands. Amen. That's Bible. If you don't like that, I'm just the mailman. Amen. That's what God said. And don't give me that nonsense. Well, that was in a different time. And they didn't do that. Oh, uh-uh. Bible, Bible is right now the Word of God. Amen. Wives, submit to your husbands. Amen. Wives, submit to your husbands. That's what it says. Don't be in rebellion. Don't be in rebellion. Church people, if you put yourself under the authority of a pastor, how dare you go around stabbing him in the back to everybody in the church? Amen. You're the stronghold. Powers, things to do with magic, the occult, witchcraft, media, addictions, things that hold power over God's people, things that you cannot break. 
And let me tell you something, and Brother Joel's standing back here, he'll tell you. There used to be guys going around, Brother Joel, I remember years ago, guys would go around to churches and doing seminars on rock music. And I was talking to one of them, Dave Benoit, and I asked him, I said, Dave, didn't you used to do stuff on rock music? He said, yeah. I said, how come you don't do it anymore? He said, number one, the music has gotten so vulgar and so bad. He said, I can't really do it justice in the house of God. He said, number two, most churches now have been infiltrated with the same music. And he said, they don't have me come back anymore. Am I telling the truth? That's what's going on. Listen, your, t your, your child, your, t your daughter, when she's eight, nine years old, she is the cutest, sweetest thing that ever walked into a room. And you let her feed herself on a steady diet of hip hop, rap, emo, black, death metal music. And all of a sudden you're looking at her and she's 13 and she's pale as a ghost. She wears black all the time, hides in her room with her lights out. And if you dare go in there and take her posters down and her music, she'll attack you. You know why? She's so full of devils that you don't even recognize your own daughter. That's what happened. Under your nose. They found a weakness. And it was your job, Dad, to protect your daughter. That was on you. It's good preaching, isn't it? Amen. Rulers of darkness. False Bibles. False doctrines. False teachers. All intent to keep God's people in darkness. I don't like darkness. I think you ought to have church service and have all the lights on. Can I hear, can I get a glory hallelujah out of somebody? I think you ought to have church service and have every light in the building on. The, 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 the way this, I had a youth pastor come, I was preaching this in Arkansas, a youth pastor came up to me, a pastor came up to me, he said, Mike, my youth pastor, he's wanting to get the teenagers off to the side and they're going to play this music and he said, he's wanting all the lights off. He said, now it makes sense. You know why? His youth pastor loves darkness more than he does light. You think all that being, that's spiritual light. It's both ways. Whenever, this man will tell you, whenever these devils come in with this music and these TV shows and everything like that, the lights go off. False Bibles, false doctrine, false teachers. Then we get into spiritual wickedness. Here we go. Fornication. Pornography. Sodomy. You know, I'm not I'm not as dumb as I used to be. And I'm just, I, do, I have no idea who it might be. But I guarantee you, there's probably somebody in this room that is a closet sodomite, male or female. Sodomy is so rampant in this nation. It is infesting our churches. And the churches, by and large, have chosen to respond by way of, let's welcome them in. We won't judge them. You know, what, you know what I suspect of a pastor who is welcoming openly sodomite people into his fellowship? You know what I suspect about him? He's a sodomite. You know why he's doing that? In order to justify his own coming out. Listen, you hear the news just like I do. You know exactly, I'm telling you the truth. But maybe there's not a sodomite here. Maybe there's a man or a woman, a young person, and that internet comes on and you just can't stop. It's making you uncomfortable, isn't it? Don't worry, I'm not going to point fingers. Ah, God told me it was you! Ha! I'm not going to do that. That's not right. God has a way of dealing with it. Amen. You know what's going to happen? The Holy Ghost is going to come to you in private and say, me and you needs to have a talk. Aren't you glad? Amen. Aren't you glad that the Holy Ghost is as much concerned about you and your privacy and dealing with you the way Jesus said it should be dealt with? Amen. See, God follows his own word. Those are strongholds. And let's, I'm not saying everybody's got to jump up and say, bless God, I looked at porn this morning. I'm not, I don't want that. 
What I'm asking you to do is understand and realize you're not as strong as you put off to be. You're not as righteous and holy as you want everybody to think you are. You're not. And I'm just telling you, there's an area of your life where they found a place, a soft spot, a weakness, and they started digging. And they've established themselves. See those little red circles? I draw circles pretty good. See those little red circles? Every one of those areas represent where a weakness where they came in and they all nested right there. And they're not going away. Leviticus 26, 37 says, You shall have no power to stand before your enemies. So here's what you did. You got into conviction, and you said, I'll never do this again. Amen. Amen. Half a week went by. Boom. There it was again. Amen. So you went out and bought Joel Osteen's book about have your best life Right now. Sorry, Joel. I'll wait for mine. <laughs> and he told you to change your thoughts. And your Savior told you you couldn't. Which one of you, just by thinking, can add a stature to your height? Joel says you can. Christ says you can't. Quit lying to yourself. Let me, tell you, let me tell you what I found out. Because I went through a time in my life where I was looking into self-help techniques. Selling Amway. <laughs> this book right here is not a self-help manual. This book does not tell you how you can make yourself a better person. This book does not tell you what you have to do in order for you to not have these strongholds in your life. Quit believing that nonsense. This book, if, if there's anything about this book, it's about what God does in your life and not what you do for yourself. Amen. Well, God helps those who help themselves. What verse is that? Show me the passage. Show me that in the old, show me that in the Psalms. Show me that at, in the book of Proverbs. I'll show you in Psalms where David said, I was in a pit and I cried unto the Lord. Amen. I want out. And God saved me. God saves you. Amen. You don't save yourself. Quit thinking that way. Whew. Thank you, God. Listen to this, 2 Chronicles 20, 15. He said, Hearken ye all Judah and ye inhabitants of Jerusalem, thou King Joshphat. Thus saith the Lord unto you, be not afraid, nor dismayed by reason of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but it is God's. Let me tell you this story. Go, you, write this down, go study it out. 2 Chronicles 20, go read the whole chapter. You know what you're going to find out? Three armies came against Jerusalem. Three. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. Jehoshaphat said... We can't beat them. And at some point, let me tell you something. I love you. God sent me up this third year. I come up here and I love you people. I'm here to tell you that you cannot quit your own self. You cannot make yourself better. You, at, at some point, I hope that God brings you to a place in life where you're laying in the crumpled heap of everything that you held dear and God took it away from you to get you to realize, if I don't do it, Mike, it won't be done. And I said, God, you're right. I can't do it. I can't do it. I've tried. I've tried all my life. I can't do it. Paul had a thorn. He had a messenger of Satan buffeting him every day. By the way, here's that number again. How many times he asked God to take it away? See, that was a pretty easy one. It had three fingers up. You should have been looking. <laughs> I know that one. It's three. Lust of flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. It's all in the Bible. Joshua said, God, we can't, we're going to lose. We're going to lose. They're going to come in and they're going to kill every one of us. I don't know what to do. And God sent the Bible. Go read this chapter. God sent the Bible to the scene. He sent the prophet. You know who the prophet is? It's the Bible. God sent the Bible onto the scene. The Bible said, guys, 
Don't worry about it. God's going to fight this battle for you. You know what God had Israel do? Judah? Put them up on a mountainside and he said, get the singers up here and sing. Sing, amazing grace, how sweet the sound. They were up there singing. You know, you know how this thing turned out? The three armies, I, lo I would love to make a movie on this. Three armies came down and they met one another. And God sent a spirit of confusion in there and they went, ah! And they started stabbing one another and killing one another and twisting their necks off and stuff like that. <laughs> shooting arrows at each other. And I would love to be there when the last two guys stabbed each other at the same time. Because the Bible said they all fell in that valley. And Judah never lifted a finger and they were just up there singing, Hallelujah. You can't do it yourself. Give up. And let God have it. Ah. Uh, God said, it shall come to pass in that day, said the Lord, that I will cut off thy horses out of the midst of thee, and I will destroy thy chariots. You know what God's doing? He's taking away the things that you're depending on to make it through life. He's taking all that away from you. He's going to make, God is going to make you depend on him. God's going to cripple you like he did Israel. Remember that? God's going to cripple you like he did Israel, and he's going to make you use him for the crutch. That's what he said. He said, I'm going to cut off thy cities and I'm going to throw down all thy strongholds. Who's going to do it? God is. Isaiah 23, 11. He stretched out his hand over the sea. He shook the kingdoms. The Lord hath given a commandment against the merchant city to destroy the strongholds thereof. What did God send to destroy strongholds? Amen. A commandment. Jeremiah 48, 40. For thus saith the Lord, behold, he shall fly as an eagle and he shall spread his wings over Moab. You know what? I, this, you may not think this, but I do. Amen. And he's saying, oh, that ain't in the Bible. The Holy Ghost descended upon Jesus as a what? The Holy Ghost is here. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. But mighty through, the, through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations. I've already touched on that. Psalm 60 verse 2. Thou hast made the earth to tremble. Thou hast broken it. Heal the breaches thereof, for it shaketh. Who is the one that can heal the breaches? God. He can patch up the wall for you. But you got to let him. Psalm 106, therefore he said that he would not destroy them, but had not Moses, his chosen, stood before him in the breach. Pastors, I'm going to teach you something. If God calls us to do anything over our congregation, he calls us to stand in the gap. So they may not be able to get the stones there in time to keep the enemy out, but there's a gap, there's a breach in the wall. And God will call pastors and some mighty men like David had. And they'll say, we got stones coming. We're not ready yet. We got, we got to mix some mortar up. We need somebody to go stand in that gap and guard that spot and make sure nobody gets in. If God calls pastors to do anything, he calls them to stand. Amen. Sleeping pastors don't stand. Pastors that are out running around all week long, downloading their sermons from Rick Warren all week. You think I'm kidding? They don't stand. I see. you know what? The devil's, gonna, the devil's going, hey guys, come here. This one's easy. God needs some people that'll stand in the gap. Dads, that's your job. Who was it? You two, you're, you're married, right? Okay, stand up. You help me out here a minute, okay? Work with me, come on. Brother Howard to pay you, so don't worry about it, all right? Come up here and stand up here, okay? Turn around. Put your arm around her. See this? Isn't that sweet? Notice how much bigger he is than her. I'm not, listen, dead serious. God made us stronger bones, more muscle density, and even 
heavier. So if we can't punch them, we'll lay on them and suffocate them. Amen? Watch this. Watch this. It's his job to protect her. It is her job to stay under his arm of authority. And when she does that, he will protect her. He will stand in all the gaps. And he'll say, honey, I love you. And if anybody ever touches you, I will blow their head off with a 38 special. She's got her own. She's got her own. Amen. But watch this. Okay. Now listen to me. This, this is good stuff. Okay. God built him different. Don't fall into this nonsense that children are born neutral and then we impose all these garbage on them. Okay. Thank you. You guys can sit down. Let me show you something real quick. Okay. About how God designed all this thing. I'm looking at this man over here. He's got his arm around her. He's the head, and, he, and his, his nature knows it, and so does hers. Amen. When you see children in school, and they're walking down the hallway carrying their books, how do the guys carry their books? Right? Yep. You know why? This is where the tools and the sword and the pistol is. You don't see guys with a tool belt around their chest like this going, oh, I like this screwdriver. You don't see that? They're, you don't see a guy reach down his shirt, pull out his gun. Amen. He's wham. It's true. How do you see? Stand up. Stand up. Don't move your arms. Stand up. Stand up. Come on, you. Yeah, stand up. Turn around. Look at everybody. That's how girls always carried their books. That's how girls always carried their books. Isn't it? You know why? That's where the baby is. It is. It is nature. Somebody say amen. amen. Quit buying into the garbage that this world has fed us. And men, take your role. Amen. It's your job, guys. And here's, here's, here's how it works. Listen, guys, I love you and I'm one of you. And I'm on your side. Usually when people come to me with problems in their marriage, I say, ma'am, won't you go on home? Because I'm going to deal with your husband. You know what the word husband means? English is an amazing language. You ought to study it. House band. He's the one holding it all together. Wow. I'm telling you the truth, ain't I? Amen. Listen, I ain't telling you nothing. God didn't have to rub my nose in it a hundred times to get me to understand. Mike, I put her and those children under your authority. And you're to protect them. Instead, you've been spending your life on everything else but your family and your ministry. Wake up. And listen, if there's anything I know about my family, I protect my family. You want to talk to my wife? You want to talk to my daughter? I'll let you talk to them. You get sassy with them, me and you's going to talk. Amen. Amen. And I protect my church, too. Amen. I've had several families, because of our ministry, move down to Festus to be part of our church. One family was an entire couple of wolves in sheep's clothing. And I spotted it and I run them out. I did, I run them out. They went to another church across town. That pastor is my friend. He called me, he said, what do you know about this couple? I said, why, you having problems? He said, yeah, I'm fixing to run them out. I will run you out if you try to undermine the authority of the word of God and the authority of a pastor over church, I'll run you out. I'm not mean either. But you have to. And then I go crawl up and weep for about a week, sick to my stomach because I had to do that. But it had to be done. What I'm just saying to you today is, people, everybody in this room, you know your weaknesses. I don't have to spell them out to you. I don't have to point you out. The Holy Ghost is already going, let me in. You and I need to talk. I'm the only one who can fix this problem. You can't. And by the way, listen to me guys and listen to me ladies. God will either do it today or he'll do it five, ten years from now. But I promise you, if you ask him, he will do it. So you know what you're going to have to learn to trust? Grace. When Paul received the answer from God that he would not remove his thorn, what did he tell him? My grace is sufficient for when you're weak. 
I'm strong. Welcome back for the Q&A. Um, this is the last leg of our journey. It's been a good journey. Yep, and uh, I know you guys are tired and wore out, but we hope that we can provide some good stuff for you now. So, I have several questions here, and some of them are directed at individuals. Uh, some of them are open to anyone, so you guys can just uh, raise your hand and say you want to give an answer to it. Don't feel obligated that you do to each question, but uh, we'll get started with this one. How many of you are afraid to talk on issues like homosexuality, and how many of you would be willing to be beheaded for Christ? I'm not directing it. This is for anyone. I'll start it. Okay. <laughs> oh, there's a... Turn it on, yeah. One of the... Just push that. It should turn green. Can you turn this mic on? Let's see. Here, just go with this one. All right. Um, one of the things that there's been many, many, many things God dealt with me about in my life over the years. I was uh, surrendered to the call to preach at 16 in, my, in the church I'm at now. I've been there since I was eight years old. And I'm just fortunate to pastor my home church. But being very cocky and arrogant, full of myself, things like that, I thought that I had a silver spoon in my mouth and had, should have everything handed to me and that's how it's going to be. And God just drugged me through just about everything you can think of to get me to where he could use me. And one of, one of the issues that God dealt with me about was we come as preachers, we have, we have received the inheritance of a legacy. God made me realize that Jeremiah sat and rotted in a dungeon because of what he said. It wasn't that he led a revolt. It wasn't that he was saying down with taxes. He was saying what God said, and they threw him in a dungeon. Paul was in jail. They beheaded John the Baptist. Okay? They killed the prophets. They laughed at them. They mocked them. They took away everything they had. And God dealt with me one day and said, Mike, that's you. You have a heritage of men who have stood with the word of God in their mouth. You have to say what I tell you to say, whether people like it. My nature is that, well, I want everybody to like me. So that's why the humor and all that stuff, I will make fun of myself because I want you to like me. But the truth of it is, I've got to say things that I'll be scared to say, but I got to say it. And so what God does with me after that is when, when you know you're sold out, you say, God, I don't care what you do as long as you do it. So that's just, you don't just, I didn't just grow up saying, I hope they cut my head off one of these days. That'd be cool. Okay, I didn't do that. God had to bring me to that place to where he sobered me up and he said, you, you have received a legacy. Everybody that came before you paid a price. Who do you think you are? That's how it was with me. Praise the Lord. Um, the question was an excellent one. And the first thing I want to say is that um, I do not, uh, well, when you, when you walk with the Lord, as the speakers do and the vast majority of you do, and you're renewing your mind with the Word of God, and you're planting the Word of God in your heart, and you're walking in the Spirit, and you're praying to God, and you're fellowshipping with the Lord, what happens is, <clears throat> when you're in ministry, and you're all in ministry, we happen to be in, in, in a more public ministry, but it's amazing, you will be put on the spot, you will be thrown into a circumstance where all of a sudden from within you, you will say things and declare things perhaps with diplomacy or boldness that surprise you, but you know it didn't come from your intellect. The Lord gave it to you and you, didn't, you were surprised by it, sometimes forcefully. Uh, I remember being on uh, CNN debating um, 
uh, a well-known uh, activist. And the way I handled it, the, the Lord gave me a strategy. Now, um, so you don't really know sometimes what you're going to say. You prepare, but, but, you know, Jesus talked about being called before kings. And in that hour, the Lord would give you what to say. So you, kn you know what to say at, at that time. But um, I don't really compromise. I know these guys don't compromise. I'm prepared to take the persecution and the adversity, despite my talk about, you know, getting over the multicolored socks. Yeah, of course I want to be accepted. I mean, who, do, who doesn't? But I also believe in being strategic. Now, when I say strategic, I'm not talking about compromise. I'm not talking about human wisdom. But God gives strategies. And so when I respond to these questions, I try to use the wisdom of the Lord. Not just autopilot, not just what I think is supposed to be right. I try to listen for the strategy of the Lord in dealing with these questions. Because sometimes the way the enemy works in communicating with a hostile culture, and it's very hostile, towards our message is that um, they want to get us sidetracked. And I try to, by the grace of God and with the Lord's help, and I pray all the time, and I know these gentlemen do also, I try to focus in. I say, Lord, <clears throat> you know, I can say this, or I can say this. But I'm not leaning on my own human wisdom and understanding. But I say, Lord, what can I say that will be the most effective for you, that it will be the most strategic for you? And then I try to speak in those terms. And sometimes that means confronting a particular issue head on. Sometimes it might mean explaining it. Um, and there's, there's different approaches. But there's no rule. There's just no rule because it's always listening to the Lord walking in a renewed mind, and when these things come up on a case-by-case -case basis, the Lord shows us what to do. I, I, I hope I communicated coherently. Thanks a lot. Uh, yeah, uh, we have to be careful. We can learn a lot by history. Uh, when we see what happened in Nazi Germany, there was compromise and not speaking up about the truth, and it cost uh, millions of people their lives. Uh, millions of Jews, the Confessing Church, very few people, uh, but the Confessing Church in Germany, which was more evangelical, they stood up for truth, and many of them, you know, lost their lives. Uh, the heritage of the church is, uh, as uh, Pastor Hoggard said, it's, uh, there's a lot of persecution beginning the very inception of the church, and prior to that with the prophets, and Elijah said, which of the prophets have they not killed? He thought he was the only one left, but his point was still true. Uh, they were killing all the prophets, and and I think I don't think we'd be in these kind of ministries uh, if we had our tails behind our legs. In fact, in my message, there was two questions there. One was on the issue of homosexuality. Uh, even in the message I gave, I had addressed that at some length, uh, that that problem. But uh, at the same time, uh, I don't believe uh, we should be pigeonholed. And I have a hard time with pastors that only talk about that issue. Not that there are a lot of them, and don't talk about adultery. Don't talk about fornication in the church. Yeah. And it seems to me that there are a lot of conservative people that hammer homosexuality while they're cheating on their wives or going to a nude bars or whatever and calling themselves Christians. So I think the church needs to be uh, preached where they're at and we need to make sure we're living holy life, but at the same time not leave out the whole counsel of God. We're called to preach the whole counsel of God, and that would, the scriptures are clear in Romans chapter 1, 1 Corinthians 6, 1 Timothy 4, the book of Jude, Genesis 18, Exodus, Leviticus, and many other passages in regard to the issue of homosexuality. I can't preach the whole counsel of God if I don't speak to what God says on that issue, especially right now when it's become one of the foremost issues in our nation. How can we not speak about it? So we're in a time where many pastors, many leaders will not make it an issue. I, I have a video on our website, Good Fight website, about Rick Warren's forked tongue. And on one hand, he stood against. We show him standing, you know, for Proposition 8, saying, you know, against gay marriage. And after, you know, the media took a strong stand the other way, he said he never said that. We show both 
areas. So I understand that issue of compromise and we, and those two questions kind of go together because the issue of losing your head over in, you know, the Middle East might be over Islam. Over here, uh, depending on how long things take, it could be being imprisoned because of taking a stand uh, for biblical morality, what God says about right and wrong. And as pastors, uh, those two issues can come together. And uh, I could have very easily left those, mess those parts of my message out especially here, you're live streaming, everything else, you know, high profile uh, prophecy conference in some areas. Uh, but I go on record with the truth. Uh, you know what? Uh, all of us here, I think, would want to be able to say, hey, we're ready to die and go to prison for you, Lord. That's exactly what Peter said, you know, before he uh, denied the Lord three times. So I take note to not charge in and say, you know, I'm ready to give my life right now. I'd die for Jesus. That's my heart. But then I know that was Peter's heart. So at the same time, I ought to be humble and say, you know what? I'm going to keep standing for the truth. And I'm going to take, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall, right? So I want to pay attention and be wise and prayerful and say, Lord, when that time comes, you know. I, I remember I went through a time a while back and uh, I got a spider bite on my head, you know. And a uh, little white spider bite. For a couple days, my eyes were like all droopy. I mean, they were like down here. I had to go preach on a Wednesday night Bible study. I'm like, look in the mirror. I'm like, man, you look creepy, you know. And, and I was like, and... You know, my doctor had told me that if you get an infection in this area, it's right by your brain, you can die very easily. And I thought, and it was spreading, I didn't know what it was, you know. And I told the Lord, I go, I was bummed out because I said, Lord, I'd rather die getting beheaded for you than a spider bite. So for me, it'd be the glory of God to be able to be a martyr for his namesake, amen. Much rather go out that way than most of the ways people go out. And then any other way, really. And the scriptures tell us uh, that in the end, you know, those who have victory over the beast, they're the ones that were beheaded because of, you know, they overcame him by the blood of the lamb, it says, and by the word of their testimony, and they love not their lives unto death. Amen? And Jesus said, he that endures the end, the same shall be saved. So my heart is, uh, you know what? Uh, the victory over the beast. Jesus got victory through his death on the cross. Amen? Our victory we have through his shed blood. Amen? But I'm excited to know that, hey, you know, Jesus said, whoever denies me, I'm going to deny them. If you deny me before men, I'll deny you before the Father and the angels in heaven. Amen? But if we confess him before men, he'll confess us before the Father and the angels. Amen? So my heart is, Lord, by your grace, by your power, by your strength, help us all stand at the end, whether that means dying through uh, a disease at the end and not, and not doing Psalm 73, the first part where he says he almost fell away because he saw the prosperity of the wicked and he's so sick. There's a lot of things we must endure as Christians. So it could be sickness or it could be uh, facing, you know, beheading in the last days or, or just being imprisoned. And I praise God because the Bible says that, you know, it talks about the glory that God gets through his martyrs. Look what happened with Stephen, you know. And there's an old saying that goes way back into the early church period where the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. And we could praise God. Paul said he was in the Philippian prison for the furtherance of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. So we should, as Christians, have a different mentality. I'm sorry, I'm just going to be honest, you know, uh, that in our country right now, we talk, oh, you know, we're going to escape any kind of persecution that comes and so forth. Oh, the rest of the world has to go through it. America must be special. America is in huge trouble right now, and persecution, I believe, is coming this way, and I believe we're in huge trouble because the church has been lulled to sleep, and we're not prepared to suffer. And that concerns me as a pastor, that, uh, you know, People, you know, China, a ton of people fell away when Mao rose. And it's because they came out of there, some of the leaders saying, we told the church that there wouldn't be any persecution. And my heart breaks because a lot of Christians are not ready for persecution. So the question we're asked, are we ready to be beheaded for Christ? I hope we can all say, yeah. In my heart, I can say, yeah. But I say it with humility. I turn that question to the church and say, are you ready to suffer for Jesus? Because I don't see a lot of suffering for Jesus going on right now in the Christian life. So I don't expect that it's going to come when they're faced with death. So I, f I fear for the church. So I, pr I think we all need to get on our face and say, God, like the early church who rejoiced after they were flogged and whipped and told not to preach anymore in the city. It says they rejoiced that they were counted worthy to suffer for Christ. And that should be our hearts. Amen. That was yep. the early church's heart. Thank you. <clears throat> By the way, uh, guys, gals and guys, I got a lot of questions, and so I apologize if we don't get to them all. We'll do the best we can. And if I see a question like that was covered come up again, it's only going to be asked once, hopefully. Okay. 
you, uh, you talk of something has to change in humans to get them to join that hive mentality. When, uh, uh, when Revelation talks about people taking the mark, they will be damned. Do you think this is why? The mark will change them so they would not be able to change their minds? That absolutely, that, and I'm assuming that was directed to me because that's what I said. And, and I absolutely believe that. There's been this concept that the mark of the beast is some people are going to be drugged, kicking and screaming, and they're going to force them to take this mark. And that's not what the Bible says. The false prophet caused them. And just as, well, I don't know how to put this. He brought about the, the teaching, the philosophies, the ideas, and then created the desire so that people will go get this thing voluntarily. The devil did not drag Eve to the tree of knowledge of good and evil, open her throat up, uh, and shove that fruit down in her mouth. He just turned her lusts toward it and said, look at it. She's the one that chose to eat that fruit. That was on her, okay? That's the way it's going to be with the mark. When we look at all this technology, I and mean, look at this. We're pathetic. <laughs> oh, listen. I'm on the high horse over here, okay? We eat this stuff up. We eat this stuff up. We've got to have our phone. Now we're, on, now we're hooked into it, and it's, and it's just getting closer and closer and closer to being on the inside of us. Yeah, turn, yeah look at him. Acting spiritual. I'm waiting for a selfie all day. <laughs> of course, I don't know even how to use my selfie. So. Anyway, so anyway, the, the thing is, it, just like uh, he's got a Mac book here, and I'm assuming that's an iPad. Right. This is a Windows machine, okay? But I have, I have an iPad, and I have an Android, and I have all that stuff. All the different computer operating systems, they all come together in the same place, and they, eat, and they use the same language, and that is the language of the World Wide Web. So technically, what that guy said on that video was right, is that it, at some point, every device, everything in this world that has a power switch is going to be connected to this main system and this main idea, and that's centralization is the devil's tool for just about everything. And they're working on nanowires and things like that that will tap into the human mind. To me, that my mind is mine, and it doesn't belong to anybody else, okay? That's, that's my heritage, what I've inherited. And I think at some point that people are going to desire all of this technology in them so they can do things they could have never done before, become the gods, and the the spirits and principalities and everything that are running this thing I think probably one day are going to throw a switch and everybody is going to be in the hive um, there was some preachers that have come out recently saying I, I, I'm I'll say it John MacArthur said it I don't I don't agree with him that he felt like people could take the mark of the beast but it'd be okay, they'd still go to heaven. Number one, the Bible doesn't say that. The Bible says, you got it, you own it. You're going to hell, okay? That's what the Bible says. Secondly, I don't think it's just this voluntary thing where, oh, put this in me so I can buy some bread. I don't think it has anything to do with that. I think it represents a fundamental, what they call, talk about a paradigm shift in the way everybody perceives the universe they're going to think differently, they're going to be different, and they are going to be, as what Peter said and Jude said, natural brute beasts made to be taken and destroyed. So it is going to fundamentally augment everything that you and I know to be humans, and Christ only died for humans. He didn't die to save puppy dogs and kitty cats. He died to save us. Okay, so hope that clears that up. Anybody else want to deal with that? Uh, briefly. <laughs> Lord, help me be brief. Uh, <laughs> no, I'm, I'm in agreement uh, very much with what he just stated. Uh, there's a lot of people teaching that you can take the mark of the beast now. Uh, oh, yeah, I've got a whole message. Uh, can believers, can Christians take the mark of the beast? And it's like, uh, who's who? Uh, and it's heartbreaking. He mentioned Don MacArthur. Uh, and also, uh, even Tim LaHaye, Jerry Jenkins, who wrote the Left Behind series. Yep. Teach that you, you know, if you take the mark of the beast, hey, you know, uh, you won't be damned. 
if you're a Christian. And you can say whether you believe in, you can fall away or you believe a real Christian wouldn't take that. Still, that's wrong. You know, that's, you know, that's not good. That's, that's sad. So I, I'm real concerned about where the church is going and what he's, what he's saying. Keep in mind, there's going to be a strong delusion. It's, it's, it's a delusion where people believe that the Antichrist is God and they're going to be killing Christians thinking they're doing God's service. And they're following the false prophet who's bringing fire down from heaven, you know, uh, telling people to worship the beast. And the image is telling people, you know, people be wiped out who don't take the mark of the beast. Put that all with the idea that the image of the beast is given life. So there, right now we can say, hey, you want life in Jesus, and that's the, that's the attraction of the gospel, is that you can be saved from your sins and be set free. But this is a, a false gospel. Look, you're offered life. Who can make war with the Antichrist? And look, look what's happening. There's life that's been breathed in the image of the beast. Perhaps there's life in the future that this guy can offer us too. It'd be such a strong seduction. But once you take the mark of the beast, if you catch that message, you can go to our podcast. They're free and just listen to uh, Can Christians Take the Mark of the Beast? And I go into the tenses and, and, and what the, the Greek says and, and so forth. It's, it's fine now. It's like yeah, Pastor Hoggart said. Once you've, you've done it, it's, it's over. So don't let anyone deceive you to think that you take that mark. Amen. 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 I guess to add another question. Yes. Oh, did you have something you want to say? Yeah, okay. I always have something to say on something. <laughs> My wife said to, to me for years, because I would talk 12 hours a day when we were dating to her, she says, you need to get your own radio program. Uh, because, uh, never mind, you, you, know, you know why. <laughs> These guys have the same problem. <clears throat> it's just the gift of ministry you like to, to expound. Um, <clears throat> well, you're absolutely right, because in the book of Revelation, Revelation 13, when you accept, nobody accepts the mark. You're not going to get a med ship or come back from a war with some kind of ship in you, and you're, you're not going to accidentally take the mark of the beast, okay? God doesn't work that way. Right. When you take the mark of the beast, there will be some kind of ceremonial event where you're going to have to renounce Jesus Christ as Lord and pledge to worship the Antichrist as God, yep. okay? You don't take the mark of the beast by accident. Now, I, I deal with the technology of this, as these gentlemen do in their DVDs and teachings. I deal with it in my book, A Prophecy of the Future of America and Mass Awakening. I want to add something to what Mike just said, uh, and I know he's familiar with it, <clears throat> and that is you have not only uh, computer brain interfaces, and this technology goes back to the 1940s, but you have the ability to uh, communicate uh, into the human mind pictures, ideas, and voices from an external uh, source, no wires, from a satellite. This was, this was done in the 50s. They could satellite project signals into specific uh, human brains because they've been experimenting with chips for years. All right? Now, that computer brain interface will hook you up eventually to, as was discussed before, to the hive mind and to the world brain. But it will also radically, you will cease being uh, the individual that God created you, you right. to be. And I want to stress this very, very importantly. God created us in the image of God. Every one of us have a unique, special, distinct personality. God knows us as individual people. Now the beast system, this is very subtle but very important, the beast system, you then become part of a collective. You yeah. merge into uh, a hive brain, a hive uh, mind, a world brain. You just merge with everybody. You cease having your unique special identity as an individual creature by God. You become a number. Satan's system is a beast system because he's a monster. He treats you like cattle. God treats you like an individual. And so the, the entire world system is one of giving you a number, giving you a mark of the beast. And you, your individuality doesn't matter, but your individuality is sacred from God. But the satanic system wants to rip that to shreds and make you into a collective hive mind. The only thing I would like to add is that <clears throat> what is our response? Well, it's not standing in front of uh, different uh, government agencies or buildings with placards, Turner, Burn, and 
going hysterical because that just makes us look like idiots for Jesus. Now, there's a scriptural uh, verse about that, but that has to be taken in context, not out of context. We're to be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. What was Daniel's reaction in the occult courts of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon? Was he protesting? He was surrounded by sorcerers and magicians and occult power. But he waited on God. He got God's supernatural answers. What was Joseph's response to the Pharaoh God King system of Egypt? He allowed God to give him supernatural answers regarding a coming famine, a specific famine, so that the uh, Egyptian God King system, they could be prepared, but that was a way of proving the reality of the biblical God and protecting God's people. So our mindset should be to listen to the Lord, to be wise as serpents and harmless as doves, and think about how Daniel and Joseph maneuvered themselves. They weren't screaming in protest, and they glorified God. Thank you. <clears throat> Next question. Nobody brought this up, so it's evidently not a key point with you, but I want to ask, any, I don't, somebody wants to ask, the term blood moons has been in the news lately. From beginning to end, the Bible tells us about Christ's return. Do, you, do the four blood moons have any significance? Do the blood moons apply to is, Israel prophecy? No. <laughs> I, I, I probably wouldn't be as uh, a succinct as Mike, but you know, without uh, disparaging the people who write on it, when you've walked with the Lord as these gentlemen have and you have for many years, these things come and go. Yes, there's a, uh, uh, the book of Acts talks about uh, the sun becoming dark and, and the moon like blood and stuff like that. And so there are principles there, but um, I'm not hanging my hat on this configuration of these seasons. Right. All right, I'm not. All right, it, it's great, uh, it's trendy, but after it's over, we'll be on to something else. So, I, I, w I will qualify the no. Uh, this this came up. Somebody asked me this, and I talked about it on my live show. Um, number one, there's some serious issues with this. Number one. Um, the idea of four blood moons, never one time will you quote a single Bible verse that talks about four blood moons in succession and what God does. There is the issue of the moon turning to blood. That is Joel chapter 2 and Acts chapter 2 and Isaiah 13 and, and other places. But here's the issue, okay? It also says that the sun would be darkened as well. Now, scientifically, the, the moon is taking on a red hue for a reason. And that reason is, is that the earth is passing between the solar rays and the surface of the moon. And it's the, the atmosphere of the earth and all the dust particles in it and everything that is, that is changing the reflection of the moon from this bright silver to a sort of a red color, okay? But the truth of it is, if the event mentioned in Joel chapter 2 and Acts chapter 2 is referencing a lunar eclipse where the sun is passing between or the, excuse me the earth is passing between the sun and the moon you have to account for also the sun being darkened at that same time okay you cannot have a both a lunar eclipse and a solar eclipse because the solar eclipse is where the moon passes between the sun and the earth okay and plus it's the sun's light passing through the earth atmosphere that causes the moon to turn red in, in these blood moon instances. That's the science of it. If the sun is darkened at this time, it would be impossible for sunlight to pass through the earth's atmosphere to cause the moon to look blood red. Does that make sense to everybody? In other words, scientifically it's possible. So I don't know what God is going to do when he darkens the sun and turns the moon to blood. But I know God's going to do it, and it's going to be something that no astrologer and nobody's going to be able to figure out. Uh, a lot, and I'm going to be honest, a lot of the hype of the four blood moons 
is based upon not scripture, but Jewish tradition. And this is something that we're told in the scriptures to back away from. We're specifically told to not fall after Jewish tradition. I love the Jews. I love Israel. They're God's people. God's going to save a remnant in the last days. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. And I hope he uses us to do it. Amen. Before we get out of here. But the thing is, they're blind, half blind. And they don't see everything. They can't see who's behind the veil of Moses. So to put a lot of emphasis on how the Jews saw this throughout the years, you got to remember, they don't see right. God blinded him for a purpose and for a reason. That's so he could give us light. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. Joel? Thanks. Yes. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> no, no. I'm actually agree with the brothers here. Uh, and I know there's a lot of prophecy written about it. It makes a lot of, uh, uh, gets a lot of headlines and stuff. And sells we all, books. yeah, we, it does. It sells, it sells books. books. And we all love prophecy. And we would be all over it if it was clear from scripture. Uh, but I have to agree with everything that's been said. Uh, I'll add just a couple little things because uh, plenty has been said. Uh, but it, there's more than the four blood moons. I don't know if you know that. There's been a ton of blood moons. It, um, a lot of times they don't make you aware of that. There's been a lot of blood moons in, in history, and most of them have very, don't land on any significant date. So they ignore those. And sometimes it's just as presented as though these are these rare blood moons. And, and also the dates sometimes don't match up. Oh, in 1948, yeah. you know, yeah. Israel became a country. Well, the blood moon was in, I think, 49. Yeah, you know, that. you know they, they make it fit, you know. And I'll add one more thing. You know, what happens? Have you ever seen a blood moon after a fire? We get fires in Southern California, and the moon turns blood red. Okay? So think about that. We see blood moons more often than most in Southern California because, and guess what's going to happen during the tribulation? The, this pit will be opened, right? And smoke will go up, right? Well, what would that do to the sun? What would that do to the moon? Oh, wow. You see what I'm saying? And then think about this. And uh, Pastor Hoggard had already mentioned this passage. He mentioned a few passages, but it says in Matthew 24, immediately after the tribulation of those days. Yeah. Not before the tribulation. Right. After the tribulation of those days, the sun will be dark and the moon will not give its light. The powers of heaven will be shaken, you know, and, and the stars will fall from the sky and the Son of Man will come in the clouds of glory. Amen and gather us up to, to, you know, and so forth, gather uh, from the four winds and what have you. So that's immediately after the tribulation. Those are the moons that we should be concerned about. Amen? Amen. So praise God. And just to clarify, people in California see lots of things that the rest of us don't see. <laughs> that, that's absolutely true. And if, if I could find it, I have a YouTube. Uh, I'm an ambassador. There. On, on my YouTube channel, um, on my iPod, my, my, my neighbor, who's a, 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 a JPL scientist, I couldn't find the planets. So I have a, a thing that you aim at the sky and it shows mm -hmm. you the planets. So I was trying to find the blood moon in the dark in my backyard. And uh, it's on my YouTube channel. It's kind of comedic as we stumble around the dark, bouncing into each other. Uh, you'll find it amusing. It's not necessarily edifying, but uh, you'll find it amusing. <laughs> I heard that people from Colorado are seeing things, too. <laughs> well, yeah, because they legalize. I was in Colorado in yeah. Boulder when they were legalizing marijuana. They've been seeing a lot of things since uh, then. <laughs> anyway, uh, next question for uh, Pastor Schimmel and anyone else can add in to this. Uh, Christian music, rock, and pop, would you say if these, this is a difference between Christian rock and the world's rock? I would say that I'm quick to speak where the Bible speaks and not speak where the Bible doesn't speak. I'm very careful not to draw lines that I don't see God himself drawing in scripture. Uh, the religious leaders in Jesus' day, they got in a lot of trouble. And sometimes it wasn't because they were liberal. Usually it was because they added a lot of rules uh, to the scripture and had their own way of what it meant to follow God. So I don't, I don't like to divide uh, or you know, say, hey, four or four times is evil. I don't have a verse that says that. So I'm very careful not to go there. And it, it, with a ministry like we have, we get attacked from a lot of people outside in the world. And I want to make sure also my arguments are biblically sound. You know what I'm saying? And so I've never been one to uh, speak uh, beyond the scripture on this issue. But I give criteria that I believe is biblical. And I'll just go through it really quickly. Uh, I personally believe uh, that the scriptures are clear that uh, music was created to glorify God. And we we're created to worship. 
And what goes on in heaven? His will on earth as it is in heaven? Well, eventually that's going to happen when Jesus comes back. But there's incredible worship going on. And it's not all soft, real mellow music either, by the way. It's loud and it talks about like the sound of many waters and thunder. It's powerful. It's very powerful. I think a lot of people will be shocked, you know. But it's going to be beautiful. It's not going to be evil. It's not going to be uh, wicked or anything like that. But the Bible says that our lyrics should, I believe, glorify God. And the Bible says, and I quoted a few verses, but I'll mention really quickly in Psalm 119, it talks about, the, the psalmist talks about how your word is the theme of my song. And I believe that should be, that's a great example to us. And the Bible says it's better to listen to the rebuke of a wise, the wise than the songs of fools. And the fools are those who are not following the Lord and not subjected to the wisdom of God, that don't believe in God. So I believe the scriptures do speak to the issue to encourage us to sing unto the Lord, uh, sing a new song. We see that more throughout scripture uh, in Revelation as well. And I believe as we're seeking the Lord, our music should glorify God lyrically. I believe the Bible also teaches very clearly that you'll know them by their fruit. And a good tree can't bear bad fruit. A bad tree can't bear good fruit. So I think we should also look at the lifestyle of the artist. You know Marilyn Manson? before he became this icon of Satanism in, in the music world. Do you know he says he infiltrated uh, clubs and claimed to be a Christian band? Do you know that? Christian death metal? That's, that's in a spin magazine. Uh, so I believe there's a lot of counterfeits everywhere. And I believe it's probably more in music ministry than just about any place. Uh, so I don't, I, so also we lyrics, look at the artist. And also as far as the, the type of music, uh, I've searched the scripture. And I have found this scripture that helps me out and I hope it'll help you. It says, as far as the attitude of the music, sing with grace or thanksgiving in your heart unto the Lord. Amen. So there's, there's a lot of popular music right now, uh, like Screamo, where you, you can't, I mean, it sounds like demon singing. I'm sorry. It's like, ah, just, and it's like, it's like vicious, angry, evil sounding. And it sounds like what Legion, I would imagine, sounded in, when Jesus was talking to this Legion of, of spirit entities. And when the Bible says sing with grace in your heart, and I hear anger, I hear arrogance in a lot of the singing and so forth, or the musical style. And I know it's a little bit subjective at that point, but I believe we all need to go before the Lord and say, Lord, does this glorify you? Does it make me want to lift my hands and praise you and worship you and surrender to you? Or does it make me want to bang my head and think about myself and, and being my own God, you know? So I believe we can look at lyrics. I believe we can look at uh, the, the lifestyle of the musicians. And we also need to look, number three, at uh, also the the attitude of the worship or the music. I, for one, I encourage people, just sing the Lord more, man. That solves a lot of problems because instead of always listening, and I'm, I'm all for listening as long as you're edified and built up and encouraged, but man, I can't tell you how many times I, I've, my, my Christian radio has broken and I lift, leave it broken for months and months at a time sometimes in the past, just praising God. I was working before I was a Christian as, uh, as a laborer. Before I started setting tile on my own, I was working setting brick uh, as a laborer, just making the mud and stuff. And the music was blasted. And then I'd hop in the vehicle and the music was blasted again. And I'd pray, Lord, you know, help me. And I, you know, my ministry, that would really drive me crazy, right? So I'm like, Lord, you know, and you know what? The radio broke. And the guy, at the, the, you know, there was a family I was working with, and the guy's like, man, I can't, man, it's a bummer. My radio broke. I'm like, thank God, man. I hop in the guy's vehicle, because we all go to lunch together, and I usually sit in the back of the truck. I'm the, in the vehicle. And the old man who ran it, named Tony, sweet guy, he's like, I can't believe my, 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 my radio. Like, all I can get is this, this religious station. I'm like, praise Jesus. Are you answering my prayers? You know. So I believe we should be seeking God on these issues. Uh, I'm not saying it's going to be that radical, but... For me personally, there, is a, there are a lot of Christian stations right now. You know, they won't play a lot of the Christian music that mentions the name of Jesus. Right. I'm telling you the truth right now. Yeah. And uh, a band just came out and said, we can't get played. We're not going to compromise, though, because we mentioned the name of Jesus. And they're talking about a certain radio Christian station. A Christian leader that was with one of these big labels came out and interview with Christianity Today and said, yeah, this is what's going on in the body of Christ now is they went to limit the name of Jesus. So what I would say is find worship music that makes you want to worship Jesus, amen, and where you can be confident that it's from the word of God, amen, and glorifies God. Amen. Um, Joe, obviously, this is like your area of specialization in your ministry. And when I was hosting a uh, nationally syndicated radio program, had Joe on for three days. Uh, and he played the clips and analyzed it, and it just rocked the nation. People were going crazy for a good thing. He shook them up and told them the truth. I just want to add one thing to that, and that is strategy. Um, I deal with this in my work. It was scientific mind control. I want to read you a quote by Theodore Adorno, 
who was a propagandist and an advertising man that began his work in the 1920s. In the secular standpoint, he's the one that convinced women it was sexy to smoke. He was behind that campaign, mm. but he was also behind propaganda campaigns. Hitler's men studied Ordono's work. He was from the Frankfurt School, and the Frankfurt School is also the school that teaches uh, the mechanisms of uh, seeker-friendly organizations and everything else. So in his 1948 work on the philosophy of modern music, Ordorno argued that the purpose of modern music is to literally drive the listener insane. He justified, he wasn't joking, this is, a, this is, a, this is a, a scientific mind control man. He justified this by asserting that modern day society was a hotbed of evil, authoritarianism and potential fascism, and that only by first destroying civilization through the spread of all forms of cultural pessimism and perversity could liberation occur, therefore music. Now, having said that, I think it's very, very important that we as individual Christians be strategic in how we communicate this. For example, when I talk to young people, <clears throat> and that could be in 20s, 30s, 15, or whatever, I don't come to them with this because they love these artists. So, you know, if I am just denouncing them or give you a quote, like they, they would just shut me down. So I, I try to learn about the music, I try to learn about the lyrics, and I try to like come up to speed as much as I can since I'm several generations older. And so I can, you know, open the door. I just don't come at them and say, oh, it's of the devil. Because remember when Christians were burning Beatles albums years ago? You probably don't remember. Okay, Christians would burn Beatles music albums because it was of the devil. Well, that caused the Beatles music albums sales to soar and it made Christians look like nuts. That's not strategic thinking. That's all I have to say on that. Thank you. <clears throat> Where does the United Nations fit into end times prophecy? Can I answer that? Yeah. The, this is very important, and my fellow speakers understand this, and many of you understand this. The United Nations was formed for one purpose primarily, and that was for the formation of a one world government, one world religion, and one world economic system. That is its purpose. Mm -hmm. The trial run was uh, after World War I when they formed the League of Nations, which fell apart because there was too many Christians in America that believed in Bible prophecy. So Rockefeller spent hundreds of millions of dollars raising up men like the Dulles brothers to infiltrate evangelical churches and to brainwash them into getting in on the globalist program. So now we have the United Nations formed and it is the, there's going to be a UN global government or some kind of global government. It will be anti-Christian in nature. And so all these church movements that are signing on board to the United Nations are signing on board to the one world government, the one world religion, and one world economic system that we're warned about in Revelation. Anyone else? Yep. I, I, again, I did this last night, but I would encourage you to get his book, um, either one. But I, I read the uh, Prophecy for a Future America, and he spells this out really well, really well, in layman's terms, in large print. <laughs> <laughs> That's no kidding. Hey, I couldn't read it if it wasn't large print. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <clears throat> this weekend, as pastors, watchmen, the body of Christ, we have heard the spiritual warnings to cry out to prepare others for what is coming. As churches, individuals, do you see a responsibility to prepare physically for what is coming? Such and such as. Well, I guess I'll speak uh, uh, out of the default position, kind of like the, the, world, uh, the, the dollar being the de facto world currency. Um, yes, um, I believe Christians should prepare both spiritually and physically. Now, when I say prepare, that's really up to you. And I would just say in a multitude of counselors, there's wisdom. So not everybody who's telling you how to prepare, you should be listening to. You need to be in the Word of God. You need to have your 
the mind renewed, you need to be listening to the Holy Spirit. There's a lot of hucksters and exploitive people telling you to prepare. Okay? And then there's some good ones. So there are general principles uh, that would apply, such as having a certain amount of food and water and currency. You need to be aware of what's going on, and you should be prepared. Um, I'm not going to give you a whole litany of strategies, but your preparedness has to be far bigger than the bunker mentality. And I'm not necessarily knocking bu uh, bunkers. There's a big one under the Denver airport, but um, that was a joke. Mm -hmm. uh, no, it wasn't. Yeah. No, it wasn't. <laughs> no, no, it wasn't. Right, right. Um, but, you know, you, you do need to prepare. And, and because if, if it was a nuclear attack, an EMP, any kind of crisis, if you didn't have food and you didn't have water uh, and you couldn't survive, you would be negligent to your family. The Mormons, and I'm not a Mormon, they are prepared to survive for months. And uh, that's a biblical principle. Anyone else? Nope. I'll speak to that. Okay. I have a... Uh, a little bit different take, but I agree in principle that, you know, I don't believe everybody needs to be prepared physically. Personally, I believe that uh, uh, God very well may call some people to prepare physically. Just because when I go through scripture, I do see, you know, there's the principle of, you know, Joseph, seven years, there was storing up for that seven-year famine. There'll be a coming tribulation period. Uh, the ant, the, the Proverbs talks about being wise. He, you know, stores for the future. Uh, a scripture talks about how the, the righteous sees the evil coming and the, the prudent, you know, and, you know, hides himself, so to speak. Uh, however, uh, the scripture also talks about, uh, you know, in Isaiah 84, eight, or 24, 25, and 6. Yeah, if I say 84, 85, and 86, I got the wrong Bible, right? Uh, 24, 25, and 6, the many, you know, uh, all the discourse, so to speak, uh, talks about, you know, God talks about hiding in your, in your room until the indignation is passed, you know. However, I also see in Scripture that if you get a bunker mentality and that I'm going to go here and this is where I'm going to hide and I'm going to put all my money in this and so forth, I mean, are we not, you know, are we putting all our, is it about us surviving or maybe God wants us to be a witness too. You know, I see scripture where God says to the disciples, if they persecute you once, then he flee to the next, you know? And I see if you got a bunker in Jerusalem, well, guess what? Aren't you going to go with the woman <laughs> into the wilderness where God's going to prepare a place for her for 1,260 days? And I believe that's the Jews, but hey, if I'm in Jerusalem and they're going that way, that might be a hitch a ride with them, you know? Uh, and when you talk about that 1260 days he nourishes them for 1260 days 1260 days what about elijah that's another picture of the great tribulation god fed him right fed him with uh, ravens and so forth so for me it's not a one size fits all necessarily you know what i'm saying god can lead you know early on when i was a new christian and and people have different views as to whether we'll go through tribulation or how much tribulation or just some persecution or whatever but my mentality early on i just read the bible and i saw wow it's going to get pretty hairy here and i thought you know what what's your will and i thought you know i had a cousin come to me great guy became a believer but at that time he wasn't yet a believer and i was sharing with him about the end times he got these books on how to build these cabins in the side of mountains and stuff and it seemed like a great idea so let's go because so i showed him like a mini presentation i was like a year in the faith that was always show, already showing people that stuff and and he was all excited i was like no man i have a lot of work to do none of my family is saved you know i can't do that and if i went and i just split and i honkered down man my family my friends that came to christ not long after that went to perhaps come to christ I, th I see it got God leads people differently, you know. I see Ezra, he's calling people to repent. He's ripping his clothes, he's tearing his beard out. Then I see in Nehemiah, man, he's tearing their clothes and ripping their beards out, calling them to repent. So God, God uses people differently. I'm not encouraging that kind of ministry right now, you know. But I'm just saying God speaks to people uh, differently. So he may lead somebody in one area, hey, take your family in this area during this time or what have you. He may lead me right now. I mean, I, I've got grandkids now. But I also feel I want to be on the front lines and sharing Jesus. And, you know, hey, it, as you get older, too, it might be easier to just go to prison. Some will go into captivity, it says, and some will be beheaded, and then get a free meal every day. Who knows? You know, I'm only joking halfway. I'm serious. You've got to see what God has for you and also not to go off the rails and you're planning constantly for the future. And the Lord might want you to be a martyr. So a lot of people are going to be martyrs for the faith and shine for Jesus in those end times. Amen? Um, amen. I live in California, minister in California, you live in California, minister in California. 
people are always leaving. I always pray and investigate exit strategies. And I remember during the Northridge earthquake and the riots, everybody moved out of California and then they wanted to move back in. They couldn't afford the real estate. And I learned a principle. It is better to be in the will of God in a troublesome, prom prob problematic place than to move where it's, there appears to be physically safe and to be out of the will of God. The issue is not, well, I'm going to move here because it's safe. The issue is, where are you going to move where God wants you to move? And it doesn't matter whether it's safe or not. God will protect you. So the issue is, where does God want you to be? And that's where you are, not where it physically appears to be uh, safe. And God blesses and, and, and provides. I've been trying to get out of California for, for a long time, and, and I, the door never opens. One thing about being beheaded, um, I am planning, my dear brother, to avoid being beheaded uh, with every ounce of my strength and wisdom. Now, uh, they may catch, catch up with me, but I uh, ain't lying down. That's all. That's just uh, <laughs> Real quick. I just got to tell you, they come to behead us right now. And you, you run off, and you're shivering over there. I get my head cut off. I'm with Jesus. I'm like, true. poor guy. True, true, <laughs> true, true, true. I'm storing all my food under my skin. <laughs> and, 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 and He'll go first. I guarantee you. He'll go first. <laughs> And this is what will happen. I will hide behind him when they come, but I'll have to be holding his head. It'll be a disgusting thing. <laughs> I'm not saying I won't find a place either. I don't know. How's the Lord lead, you know? Yeah. You know. They say it'll only hurt for a little while, too. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I watch the videos. Yeah, they don't cut very clean. Yeah, they don't Depends on what the uh, definition of a little while is. Yeah, exactly. Islam. And I want you guys to keep this short because we could go till six tonight. Yeah. yeah. Where does Islam fit in uh, to Bible prophecy? Are Muslims going to be part of the end times wars? Do you consider Islam the biggest, most dangerous cult in the world? Keep it short. Okay. I think I think Islam serves a greater purpose, and it's not the purpose of Islam. <clears throat> and what leads me to this, and I know uh, Walid Shobat, who is a former, calls himself a former terrorist, he's got a perspective on Islam that is based upon what he sees in the scriptures and what he has seen in his life. And, and I can respect that. But something, you know, I, I read a lot of books that a lot of people don't read. I bo read books on Masonry and Manly Hall. And, and Manly Hall's book, um, The Secret Teachings of All Ages, was... He spent years, and he was very well paid by an endowment, but he spent years reading everything he could get his hands on. His library is still out in California. Of all the stuff that he, he looked at every religion in the planet from here going all the way back to the creation. And what, he, what he said was in, in Secret Teachings was there is one amongst all these religions, and there, there's one great big gigantic secret that every religion has a little piece of. They all look at it from a different perspective. They have a, have a different way of describing it. But he said they all have a part of the mystery doctrine, which is the transformation of mankind. And so I took that, and you see a lot of mythologies where you have the dying God, and the dying God is slain, and he's buried under something, like Hiram Abiff is buried in the, you know, under acacia sprig, or you know this God fell into a pit or whatever. And I had heard that the, the Islamists were prepared for the 12th Imam to come to the earth once again, to be reborn, come to the earth, and put the entire earth under the dictate of Islam. And when he comes back, he's going to bring Jesus with him, to, and Jesus is going to tell everybody, you should have listened to Muhammad. Okay, that's, that's where you went wrong. And so I had this image of the 12th Imam coming down in a cloud and taking over planet Earth. And then I found out that's not where he's coming from. What I found out was, and Ahmadinejad in Iran was called a 12er. His main goal in life was to bring about the 12th Imam to take over the world. Iran still thinks that way, and Obama's going to sign a deal with the devil. That's what he's going to do. Okay? But... I found out where the 12th Imam was. He was down at the bottom of a pit, a well. And he's going to rise up out of that well one of these days and take over. And I went, dun, dun, dun. 
That's Revelation 13. So what I see in that is, is that Islam has a piece of the mystery doctrine. It's a piece. I think Islam right now serves a greater purpose, higher than Islam, and that is to destroy freedom and liberty in America, destroy Christianity in America. And Rick Warren says, let's go get those Christians, because he's right along with them. And that's the purpose that I see. You cannot build the new world with the old world still in place. You got to destroy it. You got to bring down, the goal is to build a freedom tower, 1,776 feet tall. But you got to bring down the two towers that are in its way first. Make sense? Okay. And I think Islam is that tool to destroy along with, and the devil never puts his eggs all in one basket. He's using rock, he's using philosophies, he's using false ideas in the, in the churches and everything like that. But Islam to me is a tool. Uh, very, I really have nothing to add. Very, a very good analysis, uh, and I'll leave it at that. Yeah, I'll just say if you heard, uh, if you were there, who, maybe the person uh, who asked the question wasn't there for the first day, or maybe you heard and you wanted more. But we talked a lot about uh, Islam, and we talked about Iran, and Iraq, the bear and the lion, right? And then the leopard, and how Greece is thinking of coming under Putin, which is really crazy when you think about all this, and. Uh, and they used to be part of the Ottoman Empire, which was a, a Muslim empire. Uh, I, in fact, uh, what Pastor Hoggard said is very much what I believe. I did a, uh, when I, I'm going through the book of Revelation, uh, verse by verse, on our, and you can get that on podcast for free. But uh, when I, I did a series where I, the, identifying the Antichrist, and one, the first one was identifying the Antichrist in the West. And not that there's more, there's several Antichrists, be the ultimate Antichrist. And I went through Benjamin Krem, and, uh, you know, the, uh, you, you know, uh, Pastor Hoggard was talking about Manly P. Hall, you know. Uh, he talked about ma masonry being Luciferian. This guy was radically demon-possessed, you know, and uh, uh, the Masonic Lodges and the secret societies and so forth. In that particular message, I went through how the world in the West is being groomed through the New Age movement to uh, Crowley and all these guys to accept this Antichrist figure. The same thing's happening over there in Islam. And I, the second one I showed you where even the Quran has been influenced by Gnosticism, by even Gnostic writings, and the two main Gnostic t uh, doctrines was to deny that Jesus is the Son of God and that he died for our sins, amen? And that there was this impersonal God, the ultimate depth, and that's who Islam follows, this impersonal God. So I personally believe that, uh, and as uh, was stated, uh, they're waiting, they have all kinds of government music and government radio that people listen to that's all about the 12th Imam coming. They're being conditioned over there. We're being conditioned over here. Satan can make it look this way over here, this way over there. He just tailors his, he's not, nothing, he doesn't care about truth. He's an opportunist. So he caters the lies to the different types of people. Why did he use Islam? Because he knew that Christianity was radically invading uh, the East. Uh, people were seeing their false gods just as the Romans were. And they, they started coming to Jesus. And he needed to come up with a form of monotheism that could combat Christianity that would be a false form of monotheism. And he pointed people to a Christless religion that was based on your works. But you know what? In Islam, they put you before God, Allah, who's not the true God, uh, and they put your good works and your bad works on a scale, and if your good works don't outweigh your bad works, you go to hell. Well, guess what? That's every one of us. We don't have anything to boast in but what God's done in, in and through us. Amen? Well, guess what? In masonry, they'll put a lambskin over at a Masonic uh, funeral. They'll put a lambskin over your, your, your casket, and that lambskin represents your good works at the great white throne judgment which will send you right to hell. You need the lamb, the true lamb of God. So it's all based on the same lies. It's twisted. It becomes more sophisticated in certain areas. But it's all going, the spirit of Antichrist, Mr. Iniquity, ultimately everybody's going to bow down to Antichrist. But just a little bit after that, everybody's going to bow down to Jesus Christ. So we need to make sure we're right with Jesus now. Amen? <clears throat> Next question. A Galian dialectic. Can you give some examples of how that is played out in the news media and politics and uh, world geopolitics. I know my, uh, First Mike, mention what the Hegelian dialectic okay, I is. I know Mike knows a lot about this because I've heard his teaching. So I'll just begin because I want to begin and because I have the microphone first. Can I do that? Thank you. <laughs> All right. Um, the Hegelian dialectic is very simply a strategy of radical social change where you have a thesis, an antithesis, 
and a synthesis, which is the middle. Mm -hmm. So you, what you do is you bring about a uh, thesis, let's say capitalism, and then you raise up an antithesis, which is communism. And the international bankers, for example, during World War II and World War I, they financed communism and they fi financed uh, capitalism. That's the Hegelian di uh, dialectic strategy because the end game was pushing people towards the middle, the synthesis, which is socialism. And that's done in, in churches, it's done in society. You raise up the opposites, the invisible elite raise up the opposites as extremes, but their goal is to push you into a synthesis, a central point. And so that is the behind the scenes uh, template or mechanism behind uh, radical economic change, spiritual change, social change in our world today. And it's in being employed now. So for example, um, in the whole conflict, well let's take a uh, very briefly and then I'll turn it over to Mike, on the um, economic conflict with Russia, the Ukraine, NATO, the US, uh, Greece, uh, Great Britain, and then down to Syria, Iran, Iraq, Jerusalem, okay? The BRICS nations, which are Russia and India and China and other nations, they're competing to, to topple the dollar and come up with a new world currency. Now, the international bankers control them, but they also control the American banks and the City of London banks, and they want to establish the uh, Federal Global Reserve. It appears that there's a competi competition between the dollar as the world currency and this new basket of currencies from the BRICS nations. That's what it appears to be, their currency or our currency. But the international bankers behind the scenes are using these opposite currencies to drive towards the middle, which is a synthesis, which is a brand new one world currency. Very well put. Um, we live about an hour away from Ferguson, Missouri. The Hegelian dialect is in play in Ferguson, Missouri. I have a family in my church. Um, I love them dearly. They have just, God sent them to us. Um, they're a black family. They grew up in Ferguson. And he stood and testified after the first, after the shooting. And he said, I love my people. He said, but I grew up there. And he said, I know what they are. He said, they've taught their kids for years, hate authority, work against them, don't submit to the police. They're the, they're the enemy. They're out to get you. And then they spent all their lives listening to rap and hip hop and listening to their messiahs tell them to kill, kill, kill whitey, everything like that, okay? And so that dialect is at play in Ferguson. Ferguson's not the only place. It's, it's going to spread, and here's why. Here's what Jesus said about the Hegelian dialect. A nation divided against itself, against itself, will not stand. Okay, so what is our motto? United we stand, divided we fall. America is the last holdout for Christian liberty, okay, and peace in the world. Constitutional rights, all these things we hold dear. When they take it away from America, there is no other place for us to run. We're not going to go to Canada. Amen? We're not going to, we, we, there is no other place. And so America has to fall, and the devil works in a certain way every time. This is his way. This is, we're not ignorant of his devices. And this is his primary device is to get two to clash so that you have, as he said, the synthesis. Now I'll give you the big picture, okay, of every place in the world that you see something that looks like Hegelian dialect. Antithesis, antithesis, coming together, clashing, opposites, clashing. Then you have a new synthetic idea, okay? There's a, a, a statuary in a, a museum in Egypt, and it has Osiris, the sun god. It has Isis, the fertility earth goddess. And what did they do? They were opposites. And they came together. What was produced? Horus. Horus is a picture of the Antichrist. Okay? We have that in our Bibles. Genesis 6. We have opposites clashing. 
And I told you the other day, just about every Masonic emblem you look at has to deal with the sons of God and the daughters of men. And when they came together, they produced a synthetic race of giants, hybrids. Revelation 13 is so interesting because the words there are so rich. Here's wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. They're opposites. That number is 603 squared 6. So the big picture is, in the Hegelian dialect, it's just simply following the plan of there's going to be this clash together of heaven and earth. And I see this in Christian events. And they're, they're, they're promoting heaven's going to collide with earth. And I'm going, that's not so good. Okay? Because I know what it is. I know what it represents. But that's the Hegelian dialect in a nutshell. And that really is how the devil works. Let me just say this. The, the whole thing in the 80s and 90s and it's moved into now was if churches were doing the small group paradigm. Okay? Let's get them in small groups. My idea of a small Bible study is I'm the pastor and I'm going to teach everybody in that room and they're going to listen to the word of God. That's my idea. That's not what was being done. They would bring in church members who knew the Bible. They would bring in lost people. And there wouldn't be a teacher in there. There would be a facilitator who would facilitate the opposite ends of what everybody believed. And the outcome was everybody had a consensus then of what God was and what he said. And if anybody in the group said, well, you know what my Bible says, they would go, I'm sorry, you can't be in here. Okay? If he wasn't willing to meet everybody in the middle and have this new synthetic outcome, he was cast out of the group. Okay? That's, that's part of what has damaged the spirit of the church in these days. Go ahead. That was very well said. And, and me, let me just um, apply it to uh, where you live and stuff like that. Because if you go to a school board meeting, if you go to any public meeting, a city hall, town hall meeting, if you go to a church meeting in many churches, there are always in those meetings men and women who are trained Facilitate. ch facilitators yeah. or change agents. Yeah. So you think you're as answering a question. Uh, about the educational curriculum and you don't understand that you've walked onto a chessboard and you are clueless to the rules because they're manipulating you yeah. to come to a predetermined outcome and unless you're savvy to that you probably just ought to keep your mouth shut because yeah. you got to understand the dynamics of that game and it's also town hall meetings on TV um, enough said Thank you very much. And uh, <clears throat> we have come to the end of our question and answer, and I apologize. Well, we ran out of time. Sorry. 